All right, so today's, uh, today's lecture is going to be on, obviously, the kingdom of God and the poor, um, just wage, and then the second pillar, what I call the second pillar of social justice, subsidiarity. So um, what we'll find here, just to, like to bookend it, is one, that even though the Catholic Church is extremely concerned about the welfare and our interdependence of each other, ultimately, we're not here to build the utopia, all right? That's a socialistic idea. We're not here to make heaven on earth. Um, also, we'll learn um, as we move through the just wage, which we're not going to come up with a figure, um, but with subsidiarity, how do things play out like in benefits and burdens like we talked about um, with the two forms of social justice, distributive justice and legal justice, all right? The last slide, there's really nothing for me to add to the notes, so... If it seems like I'm going to go on that one quick, I'm probably going to put it all up and let you talk and let you just write. Because um, for whatever reason, I can't seem to get through all of this. I have a lot of pop-ups, a lot of things I want to do to illustrate my points. Okay, first off, um, the kingdom of God is the focus. So with Catholic social teaching, we are ultimately focused on the kingdom of God. Everything that we do in this world is geared and oriented towards our relationship with Christ and the next. So it's focused on the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus Christ. Make sure you know that. It's focused on the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus Christ. So you really can't do theology from the outside. This is about a relationship. You know, it isn't like if I were to study about Buddhism, right? If I'm not immersed in it, I'm already missing something, and particularly in Christianity when this is all about a person, which is really the only you know, religion out there that's based on a person, right, who became incarnate. So from Isaiah, we hear the prophecy of the Lord that says, um, he is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. I mean, all this, this emphasis towards the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free. So he's here for the disenfranchised, right, for those people who have been um, marginalized in some way. Now, you should never interpret this as Oh, God loves the poor more than he loves the rich. No, that is not true, right? Um, but he came to free those. So we are ultimately focused on these people in our world, but it's directed towards the kingdom of God, and particularly the person of Jesus Christ. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, remember I told you it differs from the Sermon on the Plain? In the Sermon on the Plain, it just says, blessed are the poor. So we know that he was talking about money. Because it follows by, woe to you that are rich. But in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Matthew says, blessed are the poor, and he adds, in spirit. All right? He adds, in spirit. I just want you to know that that does mean financially poor, but it's not limited to that. There's a reason why Matthew adds that qualifier, in spirit. And this is what I want to show you. When he talks about in spirit, so he's going beyond money. What is it that he's referring to? It's what we would call the whole painful condition of poverty, right? The lowest state. In other words, you don't have the wherewithal to pull yourself up or the prestige to present yourself. You become socially dependent on others. There's just no other way around it. You certainly need other people. So it's the lowest state social on social dependence and... Um, almost defenseless from injustices, all right? Low estate social dependence and almost defenseless of injustices, oh, sorry, injustices. Think of it in terms of this, you know, no class action suit. If one of us were to take on a big congregation in a lawsuit, you know they can bury us in paperwork and lawyer fees, right? Even if you were totally correct and in the right legally, they would just drown us because there's no way that a person that doesn't have the means financially could keep up. So you wind up dropping the lawsuit. That leaves, in a certain sense, leaves the person defenseless. Now that's just one example, right? The Catholic Church, in all of its social justice teachings, begins with the preferential treatment of the poor. They come first. All right? Now, this isn't totally a religious concept. We have incremental taxes here in the United States. 
Um, a poor person may not even pay tax, or if they do, they pay less than a person who makes much more. Um, the Catholic Church would probably have a real problem with flat tax. Let's just say if everybody paid, you know, uh, 8%. Because a person making $30,000, even though their 8% is going to be less, that really cuts into what they need to live. A person making $250,000, their 8%, it's just extra, mat, extra cash. It's something they won't be able to invest, but it's never going to cut into their daily living, right? So um, there's always a preferential treatment of the poor, and we get this from Scripture. Luke says he has, he has shown strength with his arm. He has shattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put the mighty down from the thrones, and he's exalted those of low degree, that exaltation. <coughs> he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. I mean, there's, you know, again, we're not trying, we don't, I don't like class warfare, right? Many times you pit races against each other, you pit classes against each other, you're, you're nearing into Marxism, right? That's their goal. Um, the reality is, though, is that I'm always concerned when I read these. Are they talking to me? You know? And again, it's not because he loves the poor any more than he loves the rich. And it's also, don't ever interpret this as, well, I guess the poor go to heaven and the rich don't. Now, that's not true either, right? Now, there are these things that appear in our world. And sometimes we wonder how they got there and what are we going to do about them. We can refer to those things as structures of sin. So a structure of sin is rooted in a personal sin. So it's always something that individuals are doing. And because they're doing it, it's always linked to a concrete act. So it's always something personal linked to a concrete act that they are difficult to remove. They are very difficult to remove. And I'll give you a couple examples. When we had our crisis in the banking crisis, correct, um, some years ago, we had people selling, you know, predators selling loans to people who should never have signed up. They should have known better. You don't sign up for some balloon mortgage that's going to, you know, rise up. Or when the housing market fell and your house wound up, you know, you owed more in your house than it was worth. That's a real pickle to be in. Well, you know, we could talk about all the scandals that went on in the banking industry, the lack of regulation, over-regulation, all that stuff. It doesn't matter what we want to talk about, but here's the reality. Who are we held accountable? The loan officers? The bank managers? The CEOs of the bank? Well, the CEOs are beholden to the chair people. The chair people, well, they're beholden to their stockholders. The stockholders want money. The chair people are regulating all. It's like having a 20-headed snake. Who do you go after? So the Catholic Church is a real issue when you can't identify who's the people responsible for this, right? That's a structure of sin. How do you get rid of that? I don't know. Was it involved with personal sin? Yes. Was it concrete acts of individuals? Absolutely. How do you get rid of it? I don't know. It's hard, right? Uh, another example, I guess we could say, would be like housing, right? Housing, and we'll see that in a second, how I'm going to use that as an example to illustrate lack of solidarity. Um, Housing has become an investment. It wasn't always that way. A lot of people made a lot of money on houses. Um, other people, not so much. They may have lost money. Well, why? Well, because maybe back in the 50s, that particular neighborhood was deemed a lower income, so they zoned it for uh, commercial um, enterprises. Uh, even maybe hazardous uh, um, use sites. Well, what would that do to a neighborhood's um, value? It drives the price down. Well, as housing prices went up over the years, do you think their prices went up very much? Not much. It turns into what we would call a slum. What happens over, though, in the other neighborhoods where you didn't have all those industries? Well, their housing doubled in price. That's a lot of money. They, made, they became wealthy selling their houses, right? Now, did somebody put that together? <coughs> yes. Is it a concrete act that somebody did? Yes. How do you fix that? I don't know. You can't go back and give everybody reparations. I mean, so what do we do? I mean, these are structures of sins, right? They're very hard to remove. Here's a little graph to illustrate for you from the Congressional, uh, I'm sorry, Congressional Budget Office. So you go back in the early 80s, and you see um, a real uh, spread beginning between what we call the haves and the have-nots, the wealthy and those who are uh, more marginalized in their wealth. So the top 1% has skyrocketed. The highest fifth, and I don't know what income levels, I would imagine a couple hundred thousand above. 
And then the middle fifth, probably those under 150, and then the bottom fifth, those under 50,000, you see came stagnant. Now, we're not saying this should be all like a parallel graph, right? Um, and you could probably see, we could probably, without being economists, I'm not an economist, neither are you, you know, and reading, you know, I, I've read quite a bit on it, but it doesn't make me an economist. But, you know, somebody pointed out, could this have been here in the, the mid-80s, uh, the Reagan tax cuts, perhaps trickle down economics? Maybe, right? Because it does tend to favor the, the people that have more money. Um, here in the 90s, I'd almost put my money on with dot-coms. If you had expendable income and you invested in dot-coms in the early 90s, everybody made money, right? But if you didn't have expendable income, you were just paying your bills. You know, you're driving old cars, paying your bills. You don't have money to throw in the market, right? So that kind of thing. So anyway, um, that's a little disparity, lack of solidarity in within the United States. Uh, if you want to look worldwide, here's from the World Bank Development Indicators from 2008. Just two of these figures, that little uh, green sliver, that's 20% of the people in the world. This big blue slice is 20% of people in the world. So those equal the same amount of people. Um, but the world's poorest only consume 20% on 1.5% of the world's resources. These 20% consume over 75% of the world's resources. That's an issue. I mean, so a lot of our problems, you know, and the reason why I use housing is it's a consumption problem. I mean, we're, we're you know, we become the brave new world. Um, it's, you know, it's better to end than mend. That type of thing, right? Everything's throwaway. Uh, in the United States, it, maybe the statistic has changed. I haven't looked it up for a few years. But if California were its own country, like if it were to succeed from the United States, which ironically you hear some rumors, right? But if it were to succeed from the United States and become its own country, it would be the fifth largest consumer of energy in the world. Think of that. And, and, and if you want to know why, it's because of the, you know, the movie and the entertainment industry. Which, you know, not to make fun of actors and actresses, but when they go off about, you know, environmental causes, you know, it does make you wonder, you know, you're in a field that, you know, one-fifth of the, or the fifth highest consumer of energy. All right. So I want to talk to you real quick about poverty and destitution, because they're not the same thing. I personally believe I'm called to poverty. I try my best to live within it. I think most people are called to poverty, to be honest. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to be destitute, right? So what I did is I took a screenshot of my, um, my notes. I do this in the morning in activity period, and my freshman homeroom thinks I'm taking selfies. I'm not. All right, so according to the uh, Human Health, Health and Human Services, uh, if you make $12,000, $12,060 a year, you are above the poverty line or at the poverty line. For If you have uh, five people in your family, that poverty line then is 28780 all right? Now, you can live on that. You know, you're not going to go out to eat. You're not going to go on vacation. You're, you're going to have a flip phone. But you can live on that, all right? Maybe not in New York or, you know, in a city, but you can certainly live in a rural area. Um, but we'll just leave that. There was a whole host of numbers, but I wasn't here to, to, you know, display all of them. Destitution, on the other hand, is not poverty. Destitution is you lack what is adequate um, and you deprive your basic human needs, all right? So that would include you do not have proper food to eat. Um, you don't have good water. There's not sanitation. Um, you don't have adequate clothing or shelter. Basic health care, right? I mean, we don't have to talk about full-fledged health care, but basic health care. And also education, maybe not to a Catholic school or Catholic college or, I mean, a private college, but nonetheless, just, you know, basic education. Uh, now, this, too, is probably going to have some distinctions by region, right? In other words, if you live in rural India, your idea of having access to water and sanitation is going to be different than if you live in Michigan. So the peop those poor people in Flint, Michigan, that are having issues with their water, um, we're concerned about that. But in India, that wouldn't be a concern for them. That would be almost, you know, sad to say, a luxury, depending on where you're at in India, like, I guess, the western part, right? Um, even like uh, shelter, what does shelter mean for us? Shelter means for us, uh, you know, some weather type building with a loft. If you live in Haiti, you have a roof over your head, right? Like my wife is friends with a lady who, she's from Haiti, and I don't know what she makes, but like 15, 16 dollars an hour here. And she supports herself, her son, and two other families in Haiti. 
and she took her son, who was born in the United States, even though he was Haitian, he was born here. He, she took him down to Haiti um, to visit relatives, meet them, and also to show them how they live. He had a cell phone. You'll get a kick out of this. True story. And she was laughing. His cell phone died because he was playing games on it. And he needed to charge it. And he goes, Mom, where do I charge it? And she said, about eight or nine miles down that road, you'll see a pole. There's an outlet there. He thought she was kidding. She was dead serious. Now, you know, we would probably call that destitution. <laughs> you know, you know, if your guys, your iPads go, you're already freaking out, right? So the idea is, is that there's a different face. There's a difference between poverty and destitution. So we know that. Any questions? Okay. This next slide, um, we're going to talk about just wage, but we're not going to come up with a just wage. You know, I'm not going to say, well, you're going to make $15 an hour. There's a lot of factors that are involved. So we're just going to lay some parameters out. It's the best we can do. Your just or living wage um, is not driven by, uh, solely by market forces. Okay? It is not driven solely by market forces. If we left everything up to the market, you know the rich would get richer and the poor would be squashed. That's why we have unions, right? I mean, it's been our dangerous. I mean, you know, um, anybody who knows anything about OSHA and all the good work that they do, you know they came around because um, working conditions were so hazardous, people were losing their lives, right? Market forces, okay? So the idea, though, is you have to work. I mean, this isn't, you know, communism. You don't get money just because you're breathing. Labor, if you're able to, of course, allows a person to gain access to the goods of the earth. So if there are things in, on the earth that you would desire, then working for them is how you get that. So there you have the phrase from the Bible, if you're not willing to work, then don't let that person eat. I don't think they were saying to starve them. I think you're just making the point. You better be covering yourself, right? Don't live off of somebody else when you're able, when you're able-bodied. Now, there are factors including the just wage. So if we're trying to figure out what minimum wage is or how much to pay a person, there's factors to, to think about. First of all, if you pay an employee too much, if the wage is too high, you could have employed other people. I mean, I, I'm just making up a scenario. Let's say there's some you know, Silicon Valley startup, and this guy's got 80 employees, and he says, I could pay them all $180,000 a year. Well, they might be worth it. They may not be worth it. Is it possible that you can just hire more people and pay them 100? I mean, would that be good for the, the local economy? I mean, you're not going to exactly starve them out if they're paying that, right? So if, it's, if the wage is too high, you could have conceivably um, employed other people. If the wage is too low, two things happen. One, it, it's an injustice. They're not going to pay what they should be paid. It's an injustice, um, but also it's unlikely they'll work. I mean, you're not going to motivate somebody by not paying them properly. Now, there's other factors. This is kind of a reiteration of the top line. A just wage cannot simply be left to the laws of the marketplace, right? Like if you ever read, you know, Adam Smith, who was Catholic, by the way, who wrote on the economy back in the 19th century, talked about this invisible hand. The invisible hand kind of guides the market so that it doesn't get too much or too little of something. Well, the Catholic Church does not teach that. Matter of fact, if you want to hear it in a joking way, that invisible hand will slap you, all right? So it can't leave it up to the marketplace or to the will of the powerful. If you leave it to the will of the powerful, you know, they're going to put things in their favor, right? We kind of see this in our political ads. Um, we have to give people free speech, so if somebody wants to donate $200,000 to a candidate to put up some sort of commercial, if we don't let them, then they cry, well, it's against free speech. But then on the other hand, let's not be so naive that they're not going to get a nod, right? So who gets their way? The people that have the money. I know that's kind of crass and blatant, but nonetheless. Okay, now there's two other things to consider, and these aren't one-word things. I left the blanks there just to let you know that there are two things. Other things you have to consider, and this is very important, is the contribution of the individual, right? The contribution of the individual. If you have a high school and elementary school teacher that has a bachelor's, should they make the same as a heart surgeon? Doesn't seem right. So 
the contribution that a person is able to make helps determine what they, you know, their wage. The other thing is, um, let's say it this way, the financial state of the company. The financial state of the company has to be taken into account. You can't make demands that they're unable to comply with. The steel industry in Allentown is a good example of that. As, you see, if you don't, you know, if you don't have like, if you don't have unions involved, they'll crush the employee. But if the unions stop realizing that we live in a community that has to be managed, and, you, and your one goal is not just to get the highest wage and the best benefits, you're going to get to the point where the company cannot afford it, right? So, like in high school, Catholic school teaching. Teaching in a Catholic high school is notorious that it's a fraction of what you make in a public school. All right. There's no sense complaining about that. There's no sense for us grabbing torches lit, running down to the office, demanding more money. Exactly where would he get it from? I mean, maybe you guys would like to say, well, it's not fair. They should pay you more. Okay, well, then you're, you guys have to start paying $11,000 a year instead of seven. I mean, you know, so it ha you know, money has to come from somewhere, right? So you have to take into consideration the financial institution. So what happens, though, and I'm just using this as an example. When we have this disparity in income, and I'm using housing as an example not to pick on people who have big houses or small houses because it's such an easy visual, right? What is the effect of this inequality in housing on our solidarity? Well, here is a, you know, a graph for like, you know, across the world. This is from 2009. If you, lived in, if you lived in Canada, this was uh, you know, in 2009, the average square foot of a house was just under 2,000 square feet. In Hong Kong, 484. In Australia, 2,300 square feet. In China, 645. Although that did not count the rural residences in China, only the urban ones. The United States, 2,164. And Russia, 614. You know, so why do we have such a disparity in um, size of houses? Now, if any of you that are from other countries, right, or you know people from other countries, like we had somebody from um, Germany come live with us. Now, I had an expedition, which is a big vehicle, because, you know, I have a business and I tow trailers at 3,000 pounds. So you need something, right? We went to pick her up. She couldn't get over the size of the car. She never saw anything like it. We took her to the grocery store. She looked at the cereal aisle, and, and she started laughing. I mean, almost like you would wonder, what is she doing? She couldn't stop laughing, because she says, where, where I live in Germany, we have four different cereals. She goes, I never saw anything. It's like the full size of the aisle. She couldn't get over Walmart. It was a super Walmart. She couldn't get over it, right? Well, there's something to that. So when they say everything here is bigger, and we consume more, you know, there's a point there, right? Um, as far as your house uh, being an investment, the top 10% of um, income people control about 4.4 trillion of the wealth in housing. The bottom 40% collectively only have 700 um, billion. You know, that's a disparity, right? I mean, there's what what is it with that, right? That makes it this difference. Now. Let's just be honest, there are a lot of factors in housing. It's not all that simple, right? Like if you, the housing in the United States might be, I'll show you the average size, but it shrunk in New York, Boston, and Chicago because of real estate, right? But everywhere else it grew. So what's available, you know, like if you really said, well, you know what, I, I feel convicted. I want to make sure I buy a 900 square foot house. I'm not quite sure where you're going to go and do that. You're going to probably have to build it, right? So you buy a house, but you buy a house. So it's not your fault. The house is 1,600 square feet. What are you going to do? Um, the region where you live, of course, you live in New York. It's going to be through the roof for like a two-room apartment. You know, you could get probably you know a three-bedroom ranch in, in um, Pennsylvania for that. What kind of loans are available, right? Loans aren't so bad now. Some you know five, six years ago they were pretty low. When I just got out of high school, they were like eight, nine percent, right? So big difference. My brother got out of high school. When he bought his house, his first house was at thirteen percent um, interest rate. You know, think of that. Um, I my interest rate's like under three. Um, it's a big thing. Because when you buy a house, it's gonna freak you out when you see your payments, and then you're gonna see how much your interest was and how much your principal was. And you buy a house, I don't know, two hundred thousand dollars. You're gonna wonder why am I paying back eight hundred? You know, 
a lot. Anyway, so housing is just an example. I'm not picking on housing. Housing is an example of how the concentration of wealth breaks down solidarity. It is an example of how the concentration of wealth breaks down solidarity. We, we lose the sense of interdependence. And then I have a bunch of pop-ups. So this way you get good visuals. So here we go. In 1910, the average house was just under 1,400 square feet and 4.5 people lived there. Four years later, about the same size and it shrunk by about a person. Um, by 1980, we were up to 1,600 square feet and 2.7, and I'm sorry for the typo, it's 2,000, not 2010. In 2010, we were up over 2,400 square feet and about the same size, okay? Um, and what this doesn't account for is storage units. When I was in high school, I, I didn't know there was no storage units, you know? So now we don't even have bigger houses with less people, and we still can't fit everything out, right? That type of thing. So if you want to see what they look like, this would be a visual of what each of these size houses look like. So we went with having uh, more people living in a house that size to less people living in a house this size. Now, we have to ask ourselves why. I mean, part of this is people build what people want to buy, right? That type of thing. It doesn't stop there, obviously. This is what a 3,600 square foot house might look like. This is what a 4,500 square foot house would look like. Now, I live in a borough, but outside of my borough is um, a development, and I am telling you that's the smallest house in a development. You know? What else this doesn't account for is ceiling heights have gone up 10 feet. Um, I didn't have air conditioning in my house when I was in high school. Um, when I was in college, my, my dad bought a window unit. Um, now we have central air. What's the impact of that on the environment? Um, you own these houses. Um, it's, it's unlikely you're, you're doing the mulch and, and, the, and the, the yard. You know, you have people coming in. Um, the person I know that lives over in the development I spoke about, they also have two cleaning ladies that come in, right? So, I mean, you think of how this escalates, right? And by the way, the person I'm talking about lives there by herself, you know? So, nonetheless, I think we have to consider all of this, and this is part of solidarity and it's part of social justice. What are we consuming? Because that's our problem. We just consume. And how does this affect the environment? And so again, you know, if you have a, a 4,600 square foot house and you have solar panels on the roof with a Prius in the driveway, I want, does that balance anything out? I mean, it's nice that you're doing that. I guess it's something better than nothing. Well, you probably, you know, and then where do you go on vacations? If you're flying on your vacations, you know, what is a person's personal footprint, right? So we can even talk about this in terms of solidarity with other countries. In other words, if the United States and China and other industrialized countries have done their share of polluting the world and they've become rich from it, is it fair for us to limit underdeveloped countries who don't have access to that kind of industry? and now we're regulating them, and they're not going to be able to build wealth. That's something else we have to consider, all these things, right? There's nobody upstairs making all these decisions, but nonetheless. What does it have to do with? There's really nothing. It's just whatever else we can come up with. I wasn't going to. If I thought of something, I was going to throw it out there. All right. You guys, I mean, you guys are the easiest class. I always get through everything. This is the last slide. And this is the last thing that, that you, I have to add anything to. Everything else up there are, are just um, complete. Subsidiarity, this is what I would call the second pillar of social justice. This is, this, is, this is a great principle, right? It's typically known as the principle of subsidiarity. And I'm going to give you a very basic definition, and then I'm going to explain it and give you examples. So it's a community of a higher order should not interfere, interfere with, of one with a lower order but always be ready to offer aid, right? It's a community of a higher order should not interfere with one of a lower order, but they should always be ready to offer aid, all right? So this is the Catholic Church's um, basic way of saying it's best done at the lower level, you know, but the upper level's got to be ready to help because you can't, you know, you need help. So here's a couple examples. 
it would not be good if the United States, from a national level, got overly involved in education. There's no way. How do they know what the needs are in Reading? And how are the needs in Reading different from the needs are in rural Memphis, Tennessee? And how is that different from um, urban areas in LA? There's no way we're dealing with the same, same um, environment. How is somebody or any people in DC going to know what's best for all those people? They're not. People close by are going to know, right? That's subsidiarity. Let them do it, but be ready to help if they need help. Let's talk about it in this school. Um, it would be ridiculous, and Mr. Ballister would never micromanage my classroom. He wouldn't come in and try to get into my curriculum and say, you need to do this, this, and this. Not because it's not his field, because he knows I'm basically, I'm the one on the ground. I know how to react with the students, and I know what they need to hear and how they need to hear it. But I, if I need his help, he has to be ready to help me. Now, we can go up above. It would be ridiculous for Allentown Diocese to come down here and tell Mr. Ballister how to manage every single hour of his day. They don't know what he's dealing with on a regular basis. He's more intimately understanding of this situation than they would be. So they have to leave him alone. But they better be ready to offer him help if he needs it. That is subsidiarity, all right? Which is a, it's a nice principle. So the problem, though, is that we often find issues show up in support when we give support to people. And they also um, often show up as interference. So let's talk first real quick about social assistance. The government from the top, this is you know the top part of subsidiarity, they need to give help to the states and to people. Or how are poor people ever going to rise out of poverty? Now again, this is not staying in poverty. They're not supposed to be left there, right? If you want to know what, what's the best thing that you can do to a person who's getting assistance, it's to get them off getting assistance. That's the goal, right? If you give them too much, you got to watch. You can deprive people of their own responsibilities. So think in terms of scripture. If you're not willing to work, then you shouldn't eat. It's not trying to, you know, be a hard love. It's just that, you know, if you're able-bodied, you should do it. Don't, don't live off the government. If you give them too much, it's really going to reduce human energies, right? Like if, if for whatever reason, let's just say that the government said we can give everybody $50,000 a year. Well, how many of us would just say, heck with that, I ain't working. I mean, think about it. So it would sap our energies. Now that would never happen, but it could be that if you get too much assistance, it's going to sap our energies, okay? There's the other side here, sort of the other side that you can interfere. If you interfere too much, everything becomes bureaucratic, right? So, you know, you hear of like healthcare issues with like the, the, the VA. You hear of, uh, let, let's say like when um, the budget for military is put together. It's, you know, notoriously inefficient. Over-regulation of anything increases paperwork and it, it increases um, inefficiency. It also is removing responsibility and power from the lower institutions. Allentown should not usurp Mr. Ballister's authority in this school. Mr. Ballister should not usurp my authority in this room. Allentown wouldn't do that, and Mr. Ballister wouldn't do that either, okay? Because you have to respect the lower institution, but be ready to help them. And what happens is, if you increase what you're doing for people, you know, we're, we're always going to have to weigh out how much are we willing to give up of our income and how are they using it for other people because it's going to increase in government spending. You know, you, you might be surprised to know that the United States has only collected taxes for like the last 120 years. Before that, they didn't collect tax, right? So, there are things, anytime we ask for something, I really would like this, let's be prepared that there's going to get tax involved. And by the way, um, since we're almost done here, I have one more line. That's what happens with colleges. You know why colleges are so expensive? Ask your parents what the cafeterias looked like when they went. When I went to the cat. When I, my college cafeteria was almost identical to what you had downstairs. You had a tray, you had the main, the main thing, fruit, and something, and a drink, and you went and sat down, and you didn't go up for the second one. That was it. When I went to St. Vincent with my daughter, I thought I was at Shady Maple. I mean, I'm not even joking. They had a pizza chef. They had an omelet chef. These are people sitting there cooking. 
They had ice cream bars. They had sun. I mean, I couldn't even get over what they had. Oh, this is great. This is all free. It sure is. Just like that rock climbing thing they had to put in for everybody. And the bridge. It's all free. And that's the reason why college went from 20000 to 40000 right? So we have to watch. But why do they do that? Because that's what people want. Mr. Ditsky will tell you. When he was an admissions counselor, when people would decide not to go to his college, they would poll them. Why didn't you come here? Why? Because that school had a rock climbing unit. People created this. So the school's like, we're losing people because we don't have a rock climbing? Put a rock climbing thing in. Just charge them more. Right? And all of a sudden, we got duped, right? Last thing. We live in a universal environment. We've got to figure out the checks and balances. We've got to figure out how much help to give and how much to allow freedom. We've got to figure this out, and subsidiarity is the way to do that, right? Like, for instance, and then, and then I'll be done. I'm just going to speculate. So the Catholic Church has never spoken on $15 minimum wage. I'm just going to speculate. Their problem would be this. If we're going to charge 15, if we're going to make sure everybody gets $15 anywhere in this nation, how is that going to play out for the guy that lives in Los Angeles compared to the guy that does live in Flint, Michigan? I mean, is that really the same? You know, so aren't we better to let local communities figure out what works and not from the top down? Anyway.